good to see you this morning. As will be announced, the, uh, the teenage class that was scheduled to meet at the wards this afternoon, uh, Anthony Sick, and that class will meet at our home. Ryan will be teaching that. We'll start around 1 o'clock, and so uh, go on after services if you, you know, brought your own lunch or you're going to get some fast food or get yourself fed and then come over to the house. And we're we'll have a good class around 1 o'clock. Uh, we're starting a parenting class. I want to start at the first Sunday night in March at our home after evening services. Uh, it's going to go for, you'll have six lessons. We'll be looking at some material focus on the family put out on parenting and discipline uh, from little to adolescent. And uh, I need to know who's interested in that. I already know some names. Also, I need to know if people prefer six consecutive weeks or every other week. I'd like to finish it up by every other week we go into May, like middle of May, if we go consecutively, then we go into April sometime. And I know there's some ladies that are interested in the class that we're expecting, and I don't know when you are expecting. So I don't know if we want to do it just one week after another or every other. Let me know. Let me know if you're interested, uh, and let me know what your preference would be on that. Uh, Derek is not here. Derek is with his family in a real Sparks area, uh, worshiping with the Christians uh, down there today. And so pray for him. Uh, he, him and his family will be coming back uh, tomorrow sometime. Our lesson this morning has to do with authority. And authority is not a necessarily a popular topic in our culture. Um, and, and I think the complaint is that... Um, People feel that you can only be free without authority. Uh, you can only be free when the restrictions are lifted. And that's not true. In fact, the opposite is true. I want to talk about the blessings, all the wonderful blessings, particularly when I'm talking about authority this morning. I'm talking about God's authority. I'm talking about subjecting ourselves to God's commands. That's what I'm talking about here. One writer said the concept of authority has become one of the most controversial notions of modern times, yet the informed man knows that anarchism is an empty dream. In fact, it's unworkable. Someone laughed about the idea that a number of anarchists were getting together for a meeting. Well, the very idea of an anarchist having a meeting is a contradiction of the idea of anarchy. And then the anarchists were saying, no, it's not a meeting. We're not having a meeting. <laughs> and anarchists don't believe in things like that. But, I like what the writer said, that's an empty dream, and unchecked individualism is but inverted slavery. By individualism, I mean just doing anything you want to do whenever you want to do it. That does not equate to freedom. That does not equate to liberty or unity or blessings like that. But that doesn't equate to bondage. Particularly here I'm talking about when the individual and door is gone. When you ignore God as an individual, you're not going to find what you think you are going to find. And one of the first blessings of authority, of subjecting ourselves to God's authority in Scripture, is what a lot of people thought they wouldn't find. That is liberty. Subject yourself to God. Place yourself under His subjection. And you'll find liberty. Freedom. Um, political liberty of any kind is possible only in the shadow of some authority. <coughs> Rights are lost when God is rejected. Liberty and authority are complementary. They go together. They go hand in hand. And of course there's no real freedom in choosing to act like the devil. And there's only one thing greater than liberty. We are a country of liberty, or at least that's what we've said we are. That's at least what our family documents say. We are a country that is all about liberty and freedom. And yet, there's one thing greater than liberty and freedom. It's what gives rise to it. Authority. Authority. Without subjection to the Creator... We don't have any of these wonderful documents like the Declaration of Independence of Bill of Rights. We're not primarily an acknowledgement of the Creator first. Harry 
remind you that God is God and we're not, and that that is clear up front. Does that still only have to true freedom or true liberty is through a subjection to God's word? Jesus said in John chapter 8, 31 and 32, and here's what the text says, John 8, 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And of course, the truth and the consideration here is God's truth. Again, we're not necessarily talking about man. Man's rules can be good, man's rules can be bad. Primarily here in this lesson, we're talking about God's rules, God's expectations, subjection to Him. That will make us free. In comparison, the, the modern scientist does not feel restricted because nature is determined that she doesn't feel like, I'm not free. Not only that, but I think another great analogy would be baseball. One said a baseball diamond is perfect as far as distances between the bases. It enables things like a double play. With, with the distance of baseball, that makes a double play possible. That makes, what, that makes the game very interesting. The possibility of the double play. Uh, it, it creates things like the ability to steal, but the ability to get caught stealing. And, and that stealing third base is more of a, is, is a challenge. Or it also creates a situation of the squeeze, the squeeze at home play. All those distances are just right to make a, a wonderful game. The baseball player does not feel restricted by the fact that he has to play on that diamond. In fact, it's, I think as one, one sports writer said, it's the very shape of the diamond. It's the very distances of the diamond. It's the math of the diamond that actually makes baseball the game it is today. A smaller diamond or a bigger diamond, and you would have a completely different game. And, and I, I, I like that analogy there. Uh, and I think that's the truth the same thing biblically. Apart from God's word, you don't have liberty. Apart from God's word, you do not have freedom. We find an example of that in the God, I think, the classic example of where you need some authority to have liberty, to have freedom. And you find that in, in the garden, you have to have at least a rule to create some freedom here. Uh, they only have one restriction in the garden, Genesis chapter 2, and in verse 16. And that restriction is, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. We, we have some law, we have some law in the garden. But that law does not create a restrictive environment. That, that rule, that rule, don't eat of that tree, did not create a restrictive environment. It created a tremendous amount of liberty for Adam and Eve. Under God's authority, that's where they're at in the garden. They're under God's authority. They have many freedoms and tremendous freedoms. And they have few restrictions. In fact, one. What happened, what happened when God's authority is rejected is that liberties and rights are laws. Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, all, they lose a number of liberties and rights that the garden afforded. They, they lose quite a few freedoms that the garden afforded. And rights are still being lost. The more our culture rejects God, the more rights and liberties that culture loses. Again, I'm not against human laws and rules. There's a number of human laws and rules we need, but here's the thing that I've seen in my own mind, and there's a number of laws that we need on the books, and so I'm not against laws. But my impression is, as our culture moves farther away from God, man's attempt to compensate for that is more micromanaging people's lives. And, and look at the garden. The garden, we have one rule. How many rules? 
Yeah. I was thinking, how many, how many laws are there on the books today? How, how many laws do you think if you add them all up? All the traffic laws, all the building laws, trade laws, you name it. Food laws. It seems overwhelming of, of how much is, is in it. I know, I know, I know Zach. Zach was, he was at SEP the other day. Uh, for, uh, for those of us that ride ATVs, there's a new rule now. Uh, if you're under 16, you have to go online and take a test now to ride. Uh, as of January, next January, if you're, if you're under 30, you will have to have taken a test online just to ride a motorcycle or an ATV. The same, the same thing has happened to boats and jet skis and things like that. Um, and so additional, there's additional legislation. One restriction was necessary in order to become universal freedom. Here's something Alexander Campbell said in the Christian system about Genesis 2. He said, nor now freedom, virtue, and happiness, it was expedient and necessary to place them under a law. For when there is no law, there can be no liberty, virtue, or happiness. We read the Romans, without law there's no sin, but also without law there's no freedom or liberty. The law became a test of Adam's character, a test of Eve's character. And, and what was required was so little, was so little. It, it, it was so, the smallest restraint upon liberty of thought action, yet it was the most invaluable test of his loyalty. It placed only one restriction in the way of universal liberty. The whole earth was his to use, one single fruit load accepted. Truly God was superlatively good and kind to man. And you know what? I hope you view your Christian life, I hope you view your life in Christ basically like Adam and Eve is. That for the most part, the only restrictions that I am under by God, by God, are things that I should not want to do anyway. Have you ever thought about that? Really, the rules, the rules that God has put you under, don't, don't do this and don't do that, and do this and do that, those are things that I should want to do, and in the negative, those are things that I should want to do. I mean, you know, you know what command, either an expectation to do something or a command not to do something, would you consider unreasonable? And I can't think of one. I can't think of an unreasonable expectation that the Creator has placed on any of us. As John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, and His commandments are not a burden. There's nothing burdensome about God's rules. Hosea chapter 4, it's not on the handout. One of the nice things to me about PowerPoint is that you can put something together and then later back come and say, you know, there's, there's a verse that I, I think we do that time of putting the blessed together and kind of preaching. I want to I want to consider Hosea chapter 4. Hosea 4, 1 through 3. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. He, he has a, a, a court case against them. He has an indictment. Because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. I thought this was an interesting passage to consider as far as what happens when a nation rejects God's authority. Does it gain freedom? The first thing to note is notice Notice the plumb line or the standard that God measures a culture against. The things that God is going to measure any culture against or by or the plumb line will be, how does that nation stack up to faithfulness? That would be things like keeping your word and commitment and reliability and faithfulness to God. Kindness would be like mercy. Mercy and goodness and how you treat others. And the knowledge of God is in there. He measures, at least he measured Israel by three things, at least in this verse. Faithfulness, kindness, the knowledge of God. How do we stack up against them? And what, the, well, they were lacking on every point. And notice how an entire society breaks down when it no longer submits to God as a whole. And notice what comes in beside. 
It's not that we have freedom now. It's not that we have liberty now. But we have, we, we have the exact opposite of freedom. That's bondage. Swearing, profanity, and, and false swearing. Lying about everything. Killing, stealing, adultery. And don't, before you move on, notice at the end of verse 3, everyone who lives in it languishes. That's not freedom. That's the exact opposite. I thought that was an interesting verse to consider. Another loss of authority besides freedom and liberty is warning. Real learning only place that takes place when I'm willing to listen. Proverbs 9, teach a wise man and he'll be made wiser. James chapter 1, I don't want to be quick to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. In James 1.21, in meekness or generous, receiving the implanted word which is able to save his souls. Humble yourself, listen, be willing to learn, have a teachable spirit. The scientist does not dictate the nature, or he should not dictate the nature. A scientist simply should submit himself to, what does nature teach me here? What's the lesson? What are the facts? I'm not telling, I'm not going to dictate to nature how to behave. I'm simply going to observe nature and record what I see. I will submit to it. That's the way I'll truly learn. Knowledge is only gained when one submits to the facts. What are the facts? C.S. Lewis said, don't be scared by the word authority. Believing things in authority only means believing them because you've been told them by someone you think trustworthy. That's, a bit, that's what we mean by believing something on the basis of authority. You simply believe something from a credible, reliable source. 99% of the things you believe are all believed on authority. You believe there's a New York City. You maybe have never been there. You see pictures of it. You talk to someone who's been there. You've never been there, but you believe it's there on the basis of authority. You believe George Washington, Washington, Washington lived. The other George Washington invented the washing machine. Okay. Uh, in history, you believe you lived on the basis of authority, credible witnesses, credible sources. You've never seen an atom in your life, but you believe there's atoms. That's the poet saying based on authoritative sources. Uh, how do you really know that Mr. Obama won the election? Well, you believe that on credible sources. You believe that those election results are credible. A man who walks on authority and other things as some people do religion would have to be content to know nothing all is why. I mean, he couldn't know anything for sure. That's something worries me about our culture. It seems like we have more and more people that are getting to the point that they don't know anything for sure. They accept their own opinions. They, they just challenge everything. But also there's a place of unity. If each man is his own authority, there is neither truth nor authority. There are not as many authorities as there are individuals. There are not as many religious truths as there are religious thinkers. John 17, 20, 21. I, I think that's a great passage to make this point. Of that there's no way that we can be united. There's really no way can be, we can be united unless we agree on the right authority. Unless we submit to God. Uh, the more we do not submit to God as a culture, the more fractured we will be. I mean, a number of people have noted our divided culture, our divided culture. Our culture that is very antagonistic and conservatives and liberals and etc. And, everyone's, and everyone is on different shows shouting at one another, yelling at one another. And we're the very divided culture. And that should not surprise us. The more we move away from God, the more divisive it will become. And the more heated it will become. And the more polarizing it will become. The book of John chapter 17, 20 and 21. And I ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe me through their word. That they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art me, that we believe the same message, that we believe the apostolic message. 
When we all agree that the message through the apostles is true, then that is the basis of unity. Here's another passage, not in the hand I want you to consider on this point. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Early in the Corinthian letter, you find in chapter 1 that the Corinthians were saying, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12. That's the vision. Chapter 3, Paul says it's carnal, it's jealousy, selfish. Verse 3, you're acting like mere men. You're dividing up yourself like people do in the world. Everyone has to have their little party. Everyone has to have a little group. Everyone has to have their human leader. You're acting just like them. Worldly attitudes cause division. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.12 is a manifestation of a worldly attitude. Godliness creates unity. That would be chapter 3, verse 5. What is Apollos? Is Apollos and Paul, are they, are they individuals to be followed like a master? No. What are they? They're servants. No one worships a servant. They're God's messengers. They're God's tools. That's all they are. Apollos and Paul, we're not to bow before them and idolize them. They serve us. They bring the message to us. And then in the later half of chapter 3, I like these verses. Verse 21 says, So then, let no one boast of men like I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose between Paul and Apollos because they both belong to you. All things belong to you. In verse 22, with the Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, you don't have to choose between one of those men. They all serve you. They still all serve us today. The writing servants. Or the world or life. You don't have to choose between life and death. Both are useful for a Christian. Death is a very useful thing for a Christian. It's the next step. How are you ever going to see God make it him without dying? If the Lord doesn't come, within your lifetime. So you don't have to choose between life and death. Those are things that Christians use. They use both of those things. You don't have to choose between things present or things to come. You don't have to choose between the past or the future. They're both valuable. The future, that's my hope as a Christian. That motivates me what's in the future. <laughs> or, he says, all things belong to you. You can use everything here for God's will, for God's purpose, for God's kingdom. But, here's the key. All things belong to you, but verse 23 says, you belong to Christ. I think the thought is, if you get that right, if you get that right, that I belong to Christ, that everything else will be in its proper place in your life. If I belong to Christ, then... I can use all things for God's glory. And, and I'm not going to make a mistake. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to make a mistake of the vision. And I think that's a great example of how if we submit to the same master and the same standard of court, then suddenly we find we're unity. Authority also really helps us humility. Uh, it is true that man in this tribe will discover that Christianity calls for an intellectual humility and repentance as well as a moral humility and repentance. I thought that was kind of an interesting quote someone had. That sometimes we remember to repent morally and we forget to repent intellectually. That we forget that we forget the we, we repent of bad deeds, but we forget sometimes to repent of arrogant thoughts. Like, I want to be in charge of my life, and I know what I'm doing all the time. And I just want to be me. It's easy to remain humble when we realize that God is the final authority. It's impossible to be humble if we think that we're the final authority. That's not going to work. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 is a wonderful words. We've looked at it before in other lessons. Let's take a quick look at it right now. Particularly verse 5, it says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 
That is, I tell you, that, that may be one of the most challenging verses to apply on a daily basis. That's not easy to do. It's not easy, it's not easy to go through your head and heart and pick out every opinion that you have, every thought that you have, that God would not appreciate and get rid of it. That's not easy. That is not easy at all. That includes every prejudice. That includes every untrue opinion, even a private one that maybe you've never expressed to anyone. You have to work on that. I think the danger is you leave that private opinion in there and eventually it's going to pop out okay. or it's going to grow. But, but I tell you what, nothing like, nothing like practicing that verse on a daily basis to keep you humble and keep you on track. Keep you on track. Every day, I think all of us are bombarded. We're bombarded by a culture out there. It may be the media, it may be the people we work with, it may be a work environment, whatever it is, that seeks to set within our head speculations, lofty things, things that are not true. Uh, and no matter where you go, no matter where you go, that's, 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 that's true. On, on, either, on either end of uh, whether you're associated with people that come from a more liberal perspective or whether, whether, or whether you're at the gun shop and it's the ultra conservative perspective that not, is not necessarily true either. That's a challenge. That works. But it's, uh, tell you what, I think if you practice that, the benefit, I think, is not only heaven, but I think you practice that, I think you will become a very mature person. Not only that, but you will be a very enjoyable person to be married to. And have as a father and a mother if you're continually popping up, getting out of your head things that are contrary to God's will. I think you'll become a wonderful person if you do that. Honesty is another blessing of authority. The voice of man must not be submitted or substituted for the voice of God. Every subjective principle in religious authority, feelings, majority opinion, tradition, is found when man sitting in the place of the infinite. That is, any time that we want to substitute our feelings for God's will, our tradition for God's will, our, or the majority opinion for God's will, we're, uh, we're pushing God off his throne or attempting. And I think listening to God is my only chance to be honest and free. I will look at a passage here. It's going to be Hosea. Uh, not in the hand of it again. But we've got some, uh, a few freebies here this morning. Some things are not on the regular menu. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 4. Let's look at this verse. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. With their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves, that they might be cut off. What I recall, this is self-help. Self but it's no help at all. And I like it. I think it's Derek Kinder is the one who made this comment in his commentary on Hosea. He says, but you see in Hosea 8.4, that cry for a king, that is... They set up kings, but I did not authorize them. They set up kings and princes of their own choosing. They selected who, and in Israel, especially that was true in Israel, in Israel you had a number of kings that were assassinated. And you had them putting up whatever kings they wanted, and God says, here's the problem. I like to comment. This verse, this verse is echoed wherever the voice of the people bounds out, drowns out the voice of God, for we set up leaders and regimes supposedly answerable only to ourselves, where we treat even the moral law as subject, subject to the vote or the climate of a king. I think that's a good comment. We are making the same mistake years are made if we think that we're setting up a king or leader who's only answerable to us. Or that the laws out there, the moral laws out there, are subject to vote 
or a change of climate. And I, think, I think this was a good... And God says, and they're doing all this, that they might be cut off. Eventually the land spews you out. Palestine did that. Eventually just kicked them out. You know, they were evicted. They found themselves evicted from the land. But I, to me, that's a good verse as far as from the standpoint of you want to do that, you want to do that if you recognize God's authority and remain humble. The only consistent answer for why we do something, and I think in parenting you find the same thing that's true. Why do I have to do that? Or why can't I do that? Here's a good, here's the only consistent answer that you really can give across the board. Like this verse. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. There really is, I can't really think of any other answer that is consistent across the board that's true every time like that. That's the final say. Why do I need to love my wife? Well, you do it for the Lord's sake. Why should I submit to my husband? You do it for the Lord's sake. Why do I need to submit to the laws of the land? You do it for the Lord's sake. Why do I need to submit to my parents? You do it for the Lord's sake. I know, I know a number of people have scrapped that in our culture and said, no, that's no good. The reason we keep the rules is because it makes a more organized and unified society, but at that point everything breaks down because you say, who cares? Who cares? Well, if you don't keep the rules, you're going to get in trouble. Who cares? Well, if you don't keep the rules, someone's going to get hurt. Who cares? If there is no God, who cares? This is the only consistent answer. Why do I need to do that? Why do I have to do that? Because God said so. That's the only answer that is always true. That's kind of the buck stops there. Because God is a loving God. A loving, wise creator. <laughs> said to do it that way. Authority also creates an atmosphere of free thinking. That is, I'm only going to let God tell me what to do. Now, don't misconstrue that. God tells me to submit to the laws of the land. So God tells me to submit to other people as well. As uh, his representatives. Submit to the government, submit to your parents, submit to your husband, on and on. Submit to your employer, things like that. But at the end of the day, it's God who is the only one to tell me what to do. And slaves of sin are always slaves of men. The freedom to explore the truth without any qualifications. That's what I mean by free thinking. If I submit myself to God, then I'm just going to let the facts take me where the facts take me. Like the Bereans, Acts 17 11. I'm just going to study something to see whether it's so. I, 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 I will axe to grind. The freedom to reject anything that isn't true, even cherished and popular ideas. That is, I'll reject it even if I'm persecuted for that. Uh, if I'm rejected, if I'm persecuted because I reject Dahmer and Snittery, and we have a big anniversary now of Dahmer and Snittery, then I'll be persecuted. But I'm, I'm going to let the facts, I'm going to let the truth direct what I believe in any area. I think that's, that's your free thinking. And that leads to this. God has given me the right to preach the gospel anytime. I think we look at the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. I think we've looked at that as a chain around our neck, unfortunately, sometimes. I haven't even viewed that that way, but that's just, that's just big, that's the, that big monkey on my back. You know what that is? That's not a big monkey on my back. What that is, I've got a permission slip from the Creator. I've got papers from the creator that says, Mark, you can preach to anyone about the gospel anytime you want. No, no. <clears throat> if someone says, I want to hear about it, I've got permission to from God. I can, talk, I, can, I can talk to whoever I want to talk to about God. About the, that's 2 Timothy 4 too. Now, it's more than that. It says you need to be doing that, but that's permission. That's freedom. That's freedom of speech. I, I can speak the truth anytime I want to speak the truth about God and about this world. We should not be the one who's uncomfortable. 
God is the truth of religion. God has expressed himself through the medium of revelation, the Bible. No one has any right to claim freedom from that word. The only right we have to claim is freedom for that word. Religious freedom is not freedom from the Bible. It's freedom to hear it, listen to it, have it present. It's freedom for that word. Not from it. I think too many people refer to religious freedom as freedom from it. As we close it, I like this. The Christian believes that obedience to Christ is the only sure pathway to moral freedom and spiritual maturity. The chief sign of salvation is not a sense of freedom, even though that's great. It's the experience of mastery of obedience. That, that's a passion for liberty. It's not the first requirement. The first requirement is not necessarily a passion for liberty. It's an enthusiasm for obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I like that. The first thirst that we need to have is not necessarily a passion for political freedom or freedom. The first passion we should have as people is a passion for obedience to the Creator. That's the first passion we should have. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, brother, what shall we do? What shall we do? Verse 38. Repent and be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe you're one here this morning who's not right with God, but you have a passion to obey. I know I'm not right. I either, I either have never become a Christian, I'm outside of Christ, or I'm a Christian who has forgot what I was, I forgot why I was here. <laughs> you know, part of me, but I forgot who I was. I forgot what life was all about for a while. I understand. And you say, I, I need to get it. I 